Greetings and welcome to the Control Society Speaker Series. Um, thank you all for your patience as we got things um, uh, worked out the uh, challenges here, but um, um, I wanna uh, just extend my greetings and, and welcome, so thank you. Um, Eze uh, I'm Ezekiel Dixon Roman of the School of Social Policy and Practice, and I um, co-curate this speaker series with my colleague, Jessa Lingle of the Annenberg School for Communication. Control Societies is supported by the Provost Excellence Through Diversity Fund, the School of uh, Social Policy and Practice, the Annenberg School for Communication, and the Price Lab for Digital Humanities. This iteration of the series, which is a continuation from uh, last, the last academic year, is also um, fortunate to have benefited from additional co-sponsors, such as the Department of Cinema and Media Studies, Department of Africana Studies, the Department of History and Sociology of Science, and the Program of Race, Science, and Society. Today, we are super, super, super fortunate um, and, and so excited to have the renowned philosopher and radical Black feminist Denise Ferreira de Silva to join us. And before I introduce her, um, I want to um, uh, discuss at least briefly some few guidelines for our talk today in order to ensure a smooth, collegial, and respectful and productive conversation for, um, uh, with, our, with, our, with our guests. So first, only the speaker and, and, uh, and microphones uh, and cameras are on um, so that we do not have any confusion and background noise. There is a chat box that we invite um, each of the audience members to dialogue with throughout the panel conversation. And um, there is a Q&A box as well. However, we specify for the Q&A box that only um, questions are, are placed in the Q&A box. So um, we even um, would invite virtual applause through the chat box and praise in the chat box. But our speak, um, but for when you want to specify specific questions to our speaker, please only use the Q and A box because those those will be where the questions that I will be fielding later uh, will come from. Um, our speaker um, um, will talk for approximately forty-five to fifty minutes, and then we will open it up for Q and A. Um, if you submit a question in the chat box, um, I just want to specify, under, um, emphasize if you submit, submit a question in the chat box, it will not have an opportunity to be asked because I'm not going to be monitoring the chat box. Um, just so just as a heads up. Finally, other sort of um, sort of rule or guideline is please enjoy the talk. Um, okay, so now for the, uh, I'd like to introduce our, our speaker for today. So Denise Ferreira da Silva is professor and director of the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. An academic and practicing artist, Dr. Denise Ferreira da Silva's work addresses the ethical political challenges of the global present. Her work engages the history of philosophy in the formation of the subject in the post-enlightenment and its influence on science, technology, and governance, as well as questions around justice, political, political theoretical questions around justice um, and, and the ethical political. Her transdisciplinary scholarship has brought quantum physics, and I, and I should say has brought what would be seemingly disparate areas together, such as quantum physics, mathematics, arts, and black studies together in ways to reimagine and rethink alternative onto epistemologies and conditions of, of becoming. Um, she is the author of Toward a Global Idea of Race, um, 2007, published by University of Minnesota Press. Divida uh, and Pagavet, please excuse my Portuguese, um, um, published by Oficina da Imaginação Política and, and Living Commons in 2019. Um, also, uh, The Unpayable Debt, um, published by MIT Press, Sternberg MIT Press, which is going to be forthcoming. And also, co editor with Paula Takavarti of Race Empire and the Crisis of the Subprime. I also have the um, privilege and honor and excited opportunity to be able to say that Denise Ferreira da Silva is currently a visiting professor with us in the School of Social Policy and Practice this spring semester, where she is also teaching an online course entitled Data, Decision, Death, Security, Raci Raciality, and Policy During the COVID-19 Global Pandemic Thus Far. Um, and Denise also contributed to um, a uh, special issue that came out in Social Text Online that is based off of the Control Society Speaker Series and influenced by Control Society Speaker Series that came out last month um, in, um, in the Periscope of Social Text Online. And with all of that, without further ado, um, I wanna turn the mic over to Denise Ferrada da Silva. Thank you for joining us today. 
Thank you so much, Ezekiel, for this very kind uh, introduction. And then thank you and Jessa for uh, the invitation to be part of this amazing program. Um, just one thing I did not check before. Uh, can I just share my screen or there is something that needs to be done? No, I can't. Um, I, well, it would be nice if I, if I could be given the authorization. We, we forgot to do that. Um, before we started, but um, what I have <laughs> to share with you today is one of those experiments that I have been engaging uh, lately, um, but it's unlike most of the others. I'm not playing with anything fancy um, like equations or anything complicated like that. I'm just uh, trying out a kind, a kind of analysis to see what it takes me uh, in terms of how, um, or in terms of whether or not it would allow, allow me to say anything about how raciality and coloniality uh, operate in the, in the global present beyond the, the ways in which we, we talk, talk about it and, and, and uh, well, I, I talk about it. But um, now, one of the reasons I uh, thank you for the authorization, I'm just gonna do my screen here. Um, but it's also amazing because I, in doing this experiment, I'm actually kind of going back, uh, way, way back um, because I, I, did my master's thesis on uh, Brazilian TV soap operas. And I haven't really written, I mean, I did write um, a piece about Blade Runner as a final uh, paper in my, in, in grad school. But then since then, and that was a long time ago, I haven't written about anything related to the media. So it's nice to go back to, so, you know, my intellectual, or maybe my research origins, because um, that was the first piece of uh, research that I, I did was my MA thesis on, on soap operas. Um, okay, let me get started with this. Um, I hope you can see my, my screen. It looks like you can. So I'm hoping with these two quotes from the creator of Black Mirror. Um, Charlie Blucher. And uh, so the first one is uh, in Black Mirror, each episode has a different cast, a different setting, even a different reality. But they are all about the way we live now and the way we might be living in 10 minutes time if we are clumsy. And if that is one thing we know about mankind, it is this, we are usually clumsy. And it's no use begging Siri for help. He doesn't understand tearful pleading. Trust me, I've tried. And then the other quote as the, the black mirror of the title is the one you will find on every mall, on every desk, in the palm of every hand, the cold shiny screen of a TV, a monitor, a smartphone. So that, that's the image, as those of you who watch the series know that's the image of the cracked uh, black screen. That's, I, I'll leave it with you uh, for a while now. Um, why story? And why the first person plural to qualify it? To say what the story is about? Whose story it is? A story of us? Which story? What is meant by better? Who is included in this us? I decided to use this title for this presentation because this is how Charlie Brooker writes about Black Mirror. And even though in the quote I just showed Brooker unexpectedly, at least to me, I, I don't know whom, but he unexpectedly uses mankind to name his we, he is or they are the kind that is man, they, no, but man under the guise of humanity to be more precise. He is, they are the main character 
uh, in his plot. Perhaps one of the most poignant plots for a TV series of the past decade, the general story of Black Mirror, the story of the dangers of an, un, of an expanded techno virtual condition of existence is enticing precisely because it very directly and unapologetically foregrounds the demise of subjectivity, the first person singular conceived as the interior thing that hosts humanity and harbors its principle. Each episode shows a person or persons on the brink of being caught in a downward spiral of losing herself or himself because he or she has abused of or have been abused by a techno virtual tool which was directly or in, either by using it directly or as it was employed by another person. Though they may be part of the plot, you know, the stories are not really the typical TV love stories, romantic comedy, thrillers, or, or, or crime drama. drama. The, central, central, uh, oh, the central theme is given by the risk hidden in the techno virtual gadgets, which have become indispensable in everyday existence. Well, especially now in this COVID-19 global context. Now, if a presumed common or universal human interiority, even though that is that of man, is how Brooker's series hails its viewer, how it takes a hold of our attention, an important question becomes, becomes why it is able to do so, or maybe asking the question differently. What is it about the stories that make them work? So what I do in this talk, as I said before, is to try out a line of analysis, one that is guided by, view, by the view that it's not so much the content, but it is the particular form, the kind of story itself that makes Black Miller's tales uh, effective. So what's interesting is how it goes about gathering attention. So, you know, we can compare it with a, a known form like that of the novel, uh, the novel that since that from the 19th century on has played such a crucial role in the popularization of the Hegelian version of the modern subject. That is that view of the subject uh, that comes out in the story um, in the form of a story of a person coming into self-consciousness which is presented as a teleological process that includes, of which is crucial, the fact that that person has to deal, has to face and deal with and resolve um, contradictions. So that Black Mirror plot departs from this post enlightenment story because it is, you know, it is an eschatological plot, there is no question, right? It's, those are dystopian stories, they're not stories of, of fulfillment. But what I think makes it, it further depart from, uh, from that plot, from that figuring of uh, subjectivity is that its character's predicament, though it is told or experienced in the first person singular, well, but it does not figure a subject, I mean, because not only because I should say it, not only because it is uh, presented, told, in the first person singular, not only for that reason, uh, but yet, in spite of that, it does not figure the subject as representative of a particular social group or community. So I should say then that the novel, as we know, and the other Hegelian, -like, Hegelian version of the of subjectivity, even they are told in the first person singular, but they do, so, but they present the person as a member of a particular. Uh, nation state, if we're talking about the 19th century and then throughout the 20th century, uh, they present the subject as representative, as part belonging to a particular social group, community, a particular cultural entity, I should say. Or maybe to use the Durkheimian language, the share in some collective consciousness. 
Um, but anyway, but it's also important to see that uh, Black Mirror is not really a post, not necessarily though some may argue that it is, but I'm just reading it as not being a pre, uh, post-racial or colorblind universalist. Um, it is evident that there is an effort to do both, to have a, a, a diverse cast, but then at the same time, avoiding stereotypical uh, gender, sexual, national, uh, or racial uh, representations. Um, to be sure, though, I only I can only recall one episode, Nose Dive, with in which some reference to transgender non-conforming -conform, characters. So, but what I'm trying to say is that it is inclusive, but it is inclusive. Um, let's say along <laughs> multicultural lines and not the old universal, not the universalist transparent lines, right? So it makes the, the, and the, and that's important. I'm, even though I'm not going to spend much time talking about it, but it's important for the analysis that comes at the end, that it is important that the cast is uh, diverse, that the text is presented as multicultural, but that is not universalist, in the sense of being transparent, of all of them being the same immediately, though at some other point it is. <laughs> it is precisely what, what's, um, what's showing. And, but what's more important here is that the characters do not present any kind of racial, national, social, gender, sexual identification. So what's emptied there is the substance. Um, of the characters, so you have, you know, you have the fo the, the form of diversity without the substance, kind of like you know, most of um, implementations of diversity anyway. But that's a different different conversation. So, but what matters in uh, about the the characters is not their social attributes, uh, the particularity that particularity of which are marked by their techno virtual experiences, um, which are presented as generalizable, but not necessarily universal. Um, each character has in common with each other and with the audience, the fact that they are human, singular human beings who find themselves usually either physically or mentally in uh, violent dystopian techno virtual situations or uh, experience. Even in the physically violent situations and experiences, it is the mental in particular, the affective toll that is foregrounded. Um, tearful pledging is the term Brooker uses to signal that even though one, even though one can talk to Siri uh, or with, and Siri or Alexa, I would add, can talk back to you, it will not come to your rescue. It does not understand suffering. It may be paying attention to you, perhaps too much attention, but it does not care for, it's not affected by, by you. So, so in this talk, I basically prepare a reading of Black, I present a reading of Black Mirror that highlights how the aesthetic supports its critical commentary on contemporary on our contemporary electronically mediated existence. Here I'm highlighting primarily, and this will happen throughout, but it will become more explicit at the end, how raciality continues to do its political symbolic work, facilitating capital accumulation both ethically and economically. And I highlight that by attending to how humanity and subjectivity play play together in the series dystopian tales. Although the tales themselves are the focus of the reading, the main move in these exercises is to activate blackness capacity, blackness capacity to unravel the modern ethical grammar. And I close this talk with the general comments on the black screen, uh, Brooker's Black Mirror. individual subjectivities. Not enough, uh, quote, not enough attention 
to meet the information demands of business and society, end quote. This is the statement with which Davenport and Beck choose when introducing their textbook on, attention, on the attention economy. They produced by saying that, I quote, in this economy, capital, labor, information, and knowledge are all in plentiful supply, end quote. What's not is human attention or an attentive human mind, end quote. From here, following the model of presenting economic concepts, which is uh, the principle of sc scarcity, they present, they develop, they present a developed concept, which respectively begins with this statement that attention, attention is scarce and also that it is a resource. More precisely, they define attention as an abstract resource, as a type of currency, which can be accumulated, traded, and converted into other currencies. For this reason, they argue, uh, quote, the problem for business people lie on both sides of the attention equation, how to get and hold the attention of consumers, stockholders, and potential employees, employees and the like, and how to parcel outlier our attention in face of overwhelming options. People and companies that do this succeed, the rest fail. Understanding and managing attention is now the single most important determinant of business success." End quote. Now we can compare it with uh, Michael Goldhaber's definition of attention economy, which was cited by Tiziana Terranova, uh, quote, a system that revolves primarily around paying, receiving, and seeking what is most intrinsically limited and not replaceable by anything else, namely the attention of other human beings, end quote. So it is expected that the textbook and the critical text shared the same definition. It's a similar evaluation of it, I think. But although it is impossible to separate them, in post-enlightenment thinking, the ethic and the economic scenes of value seem to live all apart. As in this case, even though both present attention, attention as an economic scarce calculable resource, the textbook is concerned with how to harness it, while the critical commentator highlights how its value resides in its non-fungibility, that is, that is, its quality as a human capacity, as a human capacity, which assigns to it, um, you know, to the humans, the humans most cherished attribute. So that's, it is that it is not, uh, and I'm quoting here, that it's not replaceable by anything else, which means that it has uh, dignity. The question, however, is the social context in which this human attribute has come to play in the economic scene. Um, so network subjectivities, and I'm using uh, Tiziana Terranova's uh, con concept, are attention given, giving and attention gathering entities when mobilized, when, when they're engaged. So not surprisingly, as Terranova notes, in regard to the attention economy, it is that efficacy that the information reach the receiver is more important, is the fact that efficacy, that is that the information reaches the receiver is more important than content. So in this reading, I experiment with this, with reading this shift, which is a shift that she describes, and I'm not going in, 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 in for analysis of information economy, but I'm not going to, into her argument because the analysis the conclusion is, is, is of more interest. So, so I, experiment, I experiment with reading the shift. Uh, so the concern with efficacy as privileging a certain of a certain kind as a privileging of a certain kind of hailing. Um, so that is 
just, just return there as a shift from attention to information to content to the access of content to so too much information to an emphasis on the efficacy of how to get the the the, inform, the information to the receiver so this is what i what i'm highlighting here from Terranova's argument and i'm saying that this concern with efficacy is a privilege of a certain kind of hailing now this hailing this calling of attention without a concern with exchange of meanings of content is not an example of output source interpolation as it does not operate at the level of the symbolic where ideology and culture belong even though that could that which is used to be hailing in the hailing the content that is in there could be part of the symbolic but it's it's not where the, that hailing is is located so it's called for and then because what's called for is not an agreement or acceptance, a response of sorts, now something that has content. What's expected is a reaction, an indication, no matter how fleeting that message, that no, no matter how fleeting, an indication that a message was received. To this reaction, I'm giving the name of feeling to highlight the fact that it that it belongs to the static register, not to the ethical, that of principles, or symbolic, that of concepts, categories, moments, but both of which would give certain significance or maybe even a primacy to content. Feeling is then a, con a form that needs to be in place before the substantive moment, the actual meaningful emotional response arrives. That is, before I respond, I need to feel the need, desire to signal that I too paid attention and was affected by it, hailing. So I have to say that many, <laughs> yeah, well, there's something like I, one, one example, um, which is not a very explicit one, but it's significant, uh, that many times I have encountered, you know, Facebook posts uh, which I read and it's not clearly, and it's not clearly placed in what I am calling, um, which are not so clearly placed in what I'm calling here uh, aesthetic. And that happens when um, I find myself taking some time to decide which emoticon um, to use. Because it's not clear if I, it, if it will be understood that I am like when I'm angry, if I'm angry at the same thing as the person, or and and, and not that I'm angry at at the person. Um, so I think that's when the hailing, the that is a mixing of the hailing and the content. That at least I, that's how I, I I experience it. But anyway, it's all tentative. Um, so two two brief comments make. I hope they make it less vague what I'm trying to get at, if, even though it, it may remain um, abstract. Uh, so first, um, Terranova's account of this shift indicates a departure from the significance of content, for instance, in Herder's classic view of the role of communication in the constitution of a collective identity, which highlights the content of human exchanges. So a significant difference is that information theory assumes separability and does not presume or expect mutual understanding, while Herder is describing the very condition of possibility for mutual understanding when, you know, he talks about the significance of uh, information and communication and culture. The second is, it is in regard to phenomenology's uh, notion of intersubjectivity in which efficacy is not an issue because here the meaning is supposed to be in the mind of the receiver and the sender, not in whatever is exchanged as content, not, not in the matter. Hence problem, so problems such as, you know, uh, Prob possible problems that then make the, the efficacy important, like noise, uh, is only relevant under a presumption of difference. If there is an, a, a pre the presumption of identity, both in order and then in the phenomenological uh, take, 
then uh, noise is not a problem. Efficacy is not, is not an issue if the assumption is that meaning is something that's produced in the mind of, you know, it's given already in the mind of the, of the human, um, not in the content of the message. And just for uh, disclosure, that's the kind of analysis I'm experimenting with here um, in any event. So what I'd like to highlight is that, um, as Saranov argues, the social network context, you know, is 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 the computable one, right? The web of interaction that occur in these techno virtual scapes are very much structured, structured accommodating individuals. Now these individuals are not counted as bodies, but as clicks. Likes or any other reaction are not signs of, but full expressions of uh, appreciation. That is, expressions that affection with the static formal, not the in the emotional content sense, that affection has taken place, regardless of whether the message made sense. So, when posting online, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp groups, uh, TikTok, one seeks to affect not someone in particular, but as many as. Uh, new media profit from, profit from you, from me, from us giving time, attention to trying to affect what you do, because the more people you affect, you know, the more uh, economically, socially visible you are. In, anyway, um, this hailing that is the extraction of attention is a means for enabling what's in fact profitable in this economy, which is the mining of affection. Like other sectors of this new liberal model at work in the global, in global capital now, such as the financial markets, the attention economy is extractive, not productive. As much as the techno virtual infrastructure of financial and attention capital need, needs the mining of minerals to build and run its machines, it continues to extract human time in the form of attention, whether in the ever expanding, it is in the ever expanding service economy, like Uber and different kinds of delivery, online shopping, and now it's all this online food that people can buy so they don't have to go grocery. Um, shopping, but what no one does uh, in them, we don't expand, expand time doing the physical work of putting, look, no one does the, the physical time of uh, putting things in shelves, but we spend, expend time doing the, the mental work of searching and choosing and selecting. Um, but it's also that in the, in the simple gesture of swiping a, a, a trackpad, a mobile or a tablet screen or holding a key while checking a Twitter, Facebook feeds, um, attention is there. So the purpose of this extraction is precisely this mining uh, of affection in the sense of affectability to be more precise. Again, not in terms of the content of the emotion because it's not a paper, I'm not trying affect theory here, I'm just thinking of affectability uh, in the static sense. And then I should also say that in this reading, I'm actually very much uh, relying on the Kantian account of the static and the critique of, um, of the power of judgment. That's what is also behind, behind here. Now, affectability not, not, affectability, not necessarily, of course, the drawing of tears, uh, the value of affection does not reside again on its content, how it is expressed, but on what its expression necessitates, which is the expenditure, the giving or paying of time in the form of attention. Coherently, like any extractive industry, the attention, attention economy here refers to the form, attention here refers to the form, again, not the content of the mental process. And this is what gives it static character. So it is not about the content of the reaction. What counts is the quantity, the number of reactions. Not surprisingly, what's most important, the most important characteristic of a virtual media engagement is 
is its visualizability in which, you know, I also include the clicks, of course, the clicks on these Facebook emoticons or just the emoticon. Online interactions um, precisely give the weight to the visualizability, both quantitatively in terms of how many reactions, likes, wows, etc., and qualitatively. Uh, WhatsApp, for instance, allows one to see that the person has seen the message, and from there you can calculate, how, you know, how much the person valued you, you know, depending on how long they take how much time takes from visualizing and then actually replying, acknowledging uh, the message. In any event, uh, Black, uh, Black Mirror's uh, critical commentary does not address the economic dimension of the attention economy as much as it does its social dimension. So my reading of the series plot, its story of us is highlights on the fact that it is so effective because it hails its audience in the same way as the techno virtual tools it criticizes. So it hails them as individuals, that is as disparate singular effective entities who unlike Siri and Alexa do perceive tearful, tearful pledging. Consistently, Black Miller's version of humanity is its story of the human, first person plural, does not highlight content that is meaning. It assumes that regardless of a person's specific social position, which has its cultural you know, and its cultural particularities, she will respond to its hailing, to the calling of their attention uh, to the end, uh, to the calling of their attention to the risks of techno virtual existence. So, from this perspective, Black Miller's characters are human beings who meet almost, who we meet almost as surrogates, whom we can watch while they embark in a nightmare made possible by technologies, right? Both hardware and software, which go beyond the gathering of attention into the capturing of the mind itself. Consistently, that is only, I mean, consistently, I can only remember, and maybe if you watch it, you may have other examples, but I only remember one episode, which something like a happy ending shows, which is why son Junipero, and the one in which the couple, the, the women meet through a device that help dying and elderly people to experience travel back, uh, that youth, um, and the couple, I mean, uh, we can talk about that um, later, but anyway. But the thing is that we, that Black Mirror allows us, allows us to take a look at precisely what, what happens because it, because it could happen because we are, we are clumsy to repeat the quote from, from the beginning. And, um, and then as well, the form of the story um, as we look at what could have happened because we are clumsy and, but also the form of the story, this scatological dystopian take indicates that the series creators um, is, I mean, sorry, the two things, number, number one, the general hailing, look at what could happen because we are clumsy and the scatological form of the, of the story, the, more immediately percept, uh, recognizable, also indicates that the series creators have, the, the, he has a moral, or they have a moral evaluation of the technical virtual scapes that the stories portray. And this is, I find, what gives Black Mirror its appeal, what renders it scarier than doom scrolling on Facebook or Twitter, namely that, that these social media platforms seem to have a temporary and superficial hold of our attention. Uh, so it could be said that in real life, we're still pretty much, you know, wage laborer, like selling part of our time in this attention economy. While in Black Mirror, the interiorities, because at some point we were clumsy, we meet, they are either virtually or literally captive of 
the electronic uh, machine or its virtual environment. So here I'm obviously focusing primarily on the creator's ethical disposition in regards to the, this electronic virtual social environment. And I say this because even though one version or, a, or another of captivity is, common, is a common theme to most, if not all the episodes, um, this particular presentation like the captivity versus liberty, which pairs also with the indignity versus dignity, both of them related to having one's interiority exploited uh, or incarcerated, this theme does not exhaust the series commentaries on the human and, and humanity. I'm sure I haven't done all the work to look at how what else is there. Um, but you know, others may find other things. So I'm acknowledging that the theme, this, you know, captivity, liberty, dignity, indignity is not what what I'm highlighting is not all that is to Black Mirror. And I'll be happy to talk about it and, and learn from others reading. But still, that dignity has such a crucial role in Black Miller's critical commentary on the present, it makes sense. As it's been in the past 30 years or so, the, mo the main co concept in the global ethical agenda that was assembled you know, during, as the liber neoliberal framework was globalized with the creation of the World Trade Organization. Under that mandate, that was an activation of the whole of a whole range of international human rights instruments, the ones you know, of the 60s and 70s, and new ones were created. Um, and they all fell under the umbrella of the human rights framework. And of them, um, human dignity, as articulated in the philosophical text that sustains the 1948 uh, Declaration of Human Rights, would also remain guiding those principles, both the declarations and also the, the programs for their implementation. Though to that we add uh, Amartya Zen and Martha Nussbaum's notion of capabilities approach, which uh, play out primarily in the um, sustainable development model that is also presented in the, in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken, initially in the, in the 1992 conference, Rio conference. Um, okay, I'm almost done. In any event, this expansion of the human, of the human rights agenda in, in, in the 90s uh, not, would include women, indigenous people, people of color, LGBTQI plus people. And, it, and it, uh, the, it appears to be realizing the image of the human, right? Of dignity as an ethical principle in particular that presupposes and protects the multiplicity that makes up humanity's particular kind of unity. Uh, however, humanity, the ethical figure that holds this principle of dignity has never ruled alone, not, not in, in the last 30 years, not in the beginning of the 19th century. For humanity and raciality has jointly from the 19th century, um, but primarily in the 20th century, they have jointly governed the political architecture uh, the liberal political architecture, in which both figures of the human served as basis for juridical domination, economic expropriation, but also for the denial of claims of justice. In the first half of the century, raciality in the anthropological text figured intrinsic multiplicity, said character figured the intrinsic multiplicity, sad characteristic of humanity, and that and served ethically. Uh, to justify, for justifying capitals inroads in, in Africa and uh, the Asia Pacific and then imperialism. In the second half the, of the century, then the most violent aspect of raciality was exposed and black and other liberation movements were crushed um, during the Cold War. But in any event, what I'd like to highlight is only how that raciality's function in this drama has been primarily to guarantee that white Europeans retain transcendentality, which is the principle, that principle, the principle that assures dignity as a trait 
the trait intrinsic to the human. So that the point is that dignity is never extended to every human being. Um, not everyone, as we know, right? I mean, but just to remember, not everyone's rights must be recognized, protected. But back to Black Mirror. Each Black Mirror episode seemed to lament precisely how our increasingly electronically mediated existence militates against dignity. Even the unexpectedly tender San Junior Perlo episode I mentioned, I mentioned before. Each story seems to tell us of that indignity of having one's body, mind controlled by codes. Uh, so let me, I'll just comment on three episodes. I'll give you the, the Black Mirror again. Um, I'm using also these because I couldn't, I could not have access to the to the images and sounds that I want to share with you. So that's a, that's a black mirror of corporate copyright that doesn't allow us to use things for educational purposes. But anyway, so 15 million credits, which is also about how it's about how workers have their kinetic energy extracted while watching TV but who do so because of the fantasy to be on TV. So there's a commentary on the indignity of alienation, but also on lack of privacy. Nose Dive, which is about the downward trajectory of a woman who sacrificed her self-esteem in order to achieve a higher status, which is a commentary on the indignity of ambition and Black Museum in which a person's last moment of agony when executed in the in the electric chair is sold as entertainment. This is a commentary on the indignity of at the extraction of someone suffering for entertainment and also lack of, um, of empathy. Now all three episodes um, focus on what I call visual visualizability. So 15 million credits features a young men and women pedaling stationary bikes for a living that is for credits used for paying for everything in which they are coerced to use um, and they are, which they are, the credits they are coerced to use to be entertained. Um, and then when they don't, the machine knows and force them. The only way out for them is to become entertainers themselves. Uh, Nose Dives, the tragic comic story of Lacey Pounds who sees her dream of becoming an influencer plunge exactly as she tried to increase her likability by serving as a bridesmaid for a frenemy. And in Black Museum, a daughter released the memory of the last moments of her father's life, the father who died in the electric chair, which had been captured in an electronic device designed for sharing mental contents. So each figure is a reversion in which electronically mediated interior Reality renders the person an object. The phenomenological experience shift in that it is not about one seeing or being seen, visibility, right, in the world. It is about being seeable, visualizability in a self curated way, a self production facilitated by media, media facilitated by codes designed for extracting and selling attention. So, again, in 15. Um, million credits, they spend most of the day cycling and then go back to their rooms alone and are forced to watch the, the screen. Um, in those dive, that is presence, but it is mediated by the phone screen and the reputability scale that forces everyone to be, to try and please those of higher scores. In Black Museum, the machine transfers content from one brain to another. Consciousness, that is attention turns into consumption of somebody's mind. All three episodes portray a racially democratic dystopian world inhabited by humans in various degrees and moments of indignity. Highly superficial in this world, the person's value is tied to how they appear to phenomena and not to what they are, nomina. This is the scene of aesthetic, not ethical judgment. That how is measurable, comparable quantitatively in terms of having enough credits to consume in 15 million credits, reputability score and nose dive, and qualitatively through the possibility of having one's consciousness consumed, um, Black Museum. 
fully indignified humans in Black Mirror's world, individuals willingly are mediated by gadgets that extract their attention in order to market their capacity to affect and to be affected, that is their interiority. Raciality is at work here, but not, is, not in the ways we immediately recognize the bow due to the absence of exclusion or discrimination or to the absence of use of stereotypical non-white characters. As it is expected, every time the pair captivity versus li liberty has been activated in post enlightenment critical commentary, blackness figures throughout metaphorically. By default, as indignity, when humans accept to live through codes and machines represented by, but the shattered black cell, by the shattered black cell phone screen, that rendered them, and at once laborer, raw material, instrument of production render them uh, objects for consumption. More insidiously, however, blackness functions here indirectly through the implied use of slavery as a metaphor, that the screen is black is just as well. Enslavement here operates at the existential level, economic, juridic, affective, through a voluntary gesture that obtains it, namely the desire to be visualizable, hence liked, followed retweeted. Once again, raciality through the use of blackness as a metaphor allows for the articulation of difference within the transcendental ethical concept of humanity, which it usually does by indicating which one of the multiplicities it encompasses have dignity. However, Black Miller's world Raciality does not point to distinct kinds of human beings, but it signals a difference in of the human itself, which is its laws of singularity of dignity, uniqueness, I should say, dignity, when it is reduced to that which modern thought has always presented as a problematic characteristic of, characteristic of the human, because of how it shows how close the human is to the brutes and savages, that is, the racial orders of humanity, and that is affectability. So in Black Mirror, raciality plays out in what is the form of the human demise as a story of a person's loss of dignity. The connection, the connection is not really that difficult to trace. Indignity and the indifference it signals has been the main effect of raciality as an ethical construct. And it is that indignity decisions about the, the pandemic, uh, weighing between the health of the economy and the health of the some sectors of the population that has decisions that have resulted in preventable, exceedingly unbelievably high numbers of infections and death in places like the US, Brazil, the UK, Canada, and others. So they let me just close by saying that the Black Mirror's critique of our techno virtual present is blind to racial subjugation, in particular to Black subjugation, precisely because it cannot see itself Black. The Black screen is presented as also the disappearance, invisibility of the human in the code that allows for its visualization. But that Black screen, as a metaphor for enslavement, is also a reminder that much of the work of Blackness as a tool of power has been to render an effect of nature, the very past Black mirror recalls slavery in its rendering of a future in which capital lives off humans as raw materials, workers, and instruments of production, humans, bodies, and minds. That only makes sense, of course, if one attends to the other sides of extraction that render these techno virtual escapes possible and profitable. That is, if we one look at the black screen itself, focusing not on not on content, the purpose of the message it conveys, form, how it conveys the message or efficacy if it hails the viewer successfully, but focus on that of which it is made, such as uh, aluminum silicon of the LCD, uh, the copper and gold and silver that enter in the microelectrical components and wiring which are mined in the Congo and Zambia, the cotton that enter, that out of which tantalium is mined, uh, which is found in the DRC, Rwanda, and Uganda, 
the lithium used in the batteries, which is found in mine extracted in Chile and Argentina, Tibet, and Australia, the palladium and platinum used in the electrical circuitry, which is extracted in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Denise, this was a powerful, um, invigorating, engaging. Um, and of course, just, uh, I would even say just, you know, in line with, with um, what, what, you, what you often give us in your, in your work and your scholarship um, and pushing us to really think, think, think um, beyond and in ways that, that um, uh, we um, are often not, we, we may not be pushed to in, in, in normative discourse, right? Um, but also, I, I, I find myself also even in the in the way in which you um, just rounded and, and concluded um, the way in which there's a, there's a turn to um, the material extraction that even leads to um, these um, forms of dignities or indignities that then are playing out and, and being played with in and through Black Mirror. Um, so. I, I, I'd like to open it up for some questions. I have questions, but I'm gonna reserve my questions for a moment to allow others get their questions in. Um, and there are at least two questions right now in the, in the Q&A box. Um, and I encourage others to definitely post their, their questions in the Q&A box as well. So the, the first question is from uh, uh, TJ Ghosh. Um, he asked, do you see this black mirrorization as he puts it, where the critic becomes the textbook or the black mirror show becomes the black mirror device mirrored in our social movements. I continue to be intrigued slash amazed and at times perturbed by how engaging with spec, uh, spectacularity as invoked by a routinized brutal breaking of the law by the law keepers, such as the police, combines with social media organizing to result in a hailing that brings numerical forces out to the streets without engaging in the slow relationships that need to be established to engage with the slow violence of the underlying system of capitalism and imperialism. Um, R was, um, uh, was critics now becoming the textbook? Um, uh, I struggle with this a lot and um, obviously, um, yeah, so his comments both in this question. <laughs> wow. This is, uh, thank you for this question. I mean, thank you for the, for the comment and for taking what I'm, you know, this experiment of, in thinking and bringing it exactly where, um, where, where, where I, I'm, not, I'm not going to create an, a hierarchy of importance because I do all kinds of things, but it's where I, I now um, and always find it's um, most, um, most needed right which is exactly in the political stage mm -hmm. um because i think one maybe okay i'll, I'll begin from the end of the of your que of comment question and then uh, and try not to offend anyone um, including myself in the process <laughs> um so yeah i'll begin with the with the end so i want i i'm it will be clear as i as i reply which is what are we the critics, and now the question is whether critics are now becoming the textbook. Um, well, I remember when I was a sociologist um, studying in grad school that one of the texts that were, um, that called my attention um, was Giddens. I forgot exactly which one of Anthony Giddens' book now. It was something that he published in the 90s, I think. But then he said something that anthropologists had said before, and I had studied it in Brazil when I was in, in, in an undergrad, which was that one of the things that characterize this post enlightenment uh, social configurations in which we live is the fact that we are self-reflexive, right? We think about our conditions of existence. We act on it. Of course, eventually I realized that his we did not include all the we of us, of the us that are there, but anyway, that's another story. But it is important because, and, uh, and I think that also appears in Toward the Global Idea of Race, to be honest, that we have to take that into account, that the, the work that we, even the critical work, the critical statements we make, they do end up in the streets and they become, and they become 
On the one hand, they become part of the movements, whether they are reformist movements or radical movements, but you now taking a Gramscian position here, they are also they also are appropriated by the state um, in as it is um, you know deploying its its strategies for maintaining hegemony. Right, so many demand, and we, I think in the past 30 years, we, we've seen, we have seen this more and more, um, more explicitly. And then of course, in, you know, uh, in the media, we, we also, I think we have seen it more, um, more explicitly. Now, the question is, so what do we do now? <laughs> Is it hopeless? And that's where I don't think, I, okay, so I'm not going to offend anyone, offend anyone. Is it hopeless? Do we, do we have to live with it? Or are there ways in which we can, because we are aware of how the critical strategies we develop are appropriated and then recycled and sent back as, you know, as um, mechanisms for subjugation or maybe just attention now, meaning distraction, um, is how is, so if that's the case, and if we are not going to stop um, thinking and examining, critically examining, examining our conditions of existence, and also we are not going to stop trying to figure out different ways of, um, different strategies for describing different stories of us that, you know, in the source of something that will, uh, if not, if not stop completely, at least make us create some mechanisms for addressing racial violence and colonial violence and other forms of, of violence and indifference. If we're not going to do that, then I think we should must, and this is, yeah, I think I'm making it as a must, be a, just be attentive in the other sense of attentive, um, not the attention in that, you know, in that maybe I'll call it a shallow attention, but we, we have to be more attentive, play, pay more attention and, and see how, whether and how either our critical strategies are being, you know, recycled, recomposed and sent back as um, strategies of subjugation, but also at the same time, whether and how our, as you know, the beginning of your comment question, indicates even our political strategies have now you know become part of this um, of this tech not so much becoming part of the techn techno virtual uh, landscape but we are you know responding as we do in the techno virtual landscape um, but those I think I think those are conversations we, we should have um, you know, and uh, and then the, and then and then of course it's the, the work of developing designing ways of dealing and um, and responding to what seems to be inevitable in these kind of societies that you know, Giddens write, writes writes uh, wrote about writes about and we live in which is these you know, knowledge going back into the constitution of of the social. Let's see if I. Um, yeah, I think I replied most of it. No, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so we now have another question from Elizabeth Davis. Um, she says, thank you for this talk. I have, a, I have a perhaps simple question about terms. Can you say more on how you are using affectability here as in toward a global idea of race as a means of referencing interiority or lack thereof distinct is this distinct from affect and emotion, especially given emotion as a theme in your talk today? Um, yeah, so I, as I, I, I tried to just signal the distinction um, in, in different moments in the talk. So, but, but I try, but I also tried to signal the commonalities in, in at least at the end in terms of, um, of affect, affectability and affection. So, as I said, what I, I'm, I'm beginning, um, how do I, should I say that? I framed um, this particular thinking experiment, analytical uh, exercise, 
with uh, beginning with the static, which is um, which I mean we talk about the static statics thinking about art, but in in um, in the in the Kantian program, the static is um, which has to do with uh, how he changed the meaning of the the, the concept, uh, you know. But the static has to do primarily with the sensibility, with the senses, with the sensation. So it's the first moment of of um, in the cognitive process, which is the moment of you know you are affected by something, and um, and then of course the idea in there, which is very modern European, is that knowledge begins with experience, and experience is primarily about being affected by things that are. It's about the, the subject of knowledge, right? Being affected by things that lie that are in the outside. Of course, the Kantian solution there is to say that, well, even though affectability, you know, sensation is crucial in, um, in, in that moment in, for to knowledge, especially knowledge that is um, productive, productive knowledge, it is the conditions for knowledge are in the mind. So that's the interiorization and that's the basis I mean, I trace how this remains the base for the distinction between the post-enlightenment white European and this, its racial order. So the post-enlightenment white Europeans, they are self-determined because the conditions are in their mind and, this, and the racial orders are affectable subjects right? because they lack uh, the mental apparatus, the you know, capacity for entertaining universal reason that is characteristic of the human. So that's that. <laughs> that's a long one to get there. Now, um, so that's that's one. Now, when I uh, using affectability here, then I'm kind of like returning to this initial Kantian presentation of of sensibility uh, and writing of the senses, but I'm not following the the trajectory in critical pure reason, which is the one that I, you know, that info that I examine in toward the global idea of race or even critical practical reason, but I'm looking at it in the critique of judgment because that is in that book is where he says that, you know, that affectability, uh, the, he connects affectability to the static, but more importantly, because in, and that's why I, I use the static, because what's the, what's, what I'm trying to highlight, highlight there is precisely that moment when, that moment when, when, when perception, um, I should say, but maybe I shouldn't say perception, but that moment when, um, you know, some awareness of what's outside is not, uh, it doesn't come, it's not the moment of discourse. It's actually the moment of, uh, of intuition. So in the, and because it's not a moment of discourse, then it doesn't carry the concepts and principles and other, you know, the things that will characterize the modern, the modern symbolic. But it's still, but it is still interior. It is obviously so both because um, because those, those the impressions uh, that come from experience they are interior. And, and then of course, in critique of judgment, the static is a, is a feeling, right? Is a, and so, so Kant says, um, you know, the, the judgment of the beautiful, the judgment of taste, it comes from the, this um, feeling of, um, of a heart, the experience of a, an interior experience of a harmony between, um, between sensibility, between the, not sensibility between the imagination and the understanding, and it's a feeling. It's a feeling of life. It's like a tickled, because um, it's formal, right? So it's a feeling without without content. So that is oh, the how I'm taking affectability from that moment of the static in uh, in critique of um, the power of judgment, and that particular interior interior affectability. Which is, which is like, there is a feeling, but the feeling doesn't get to a meaning because something that happens, he says like between the imagination and, and the understanding, but it's not resolved 
um, by, by the understanding. So emotion, um, it is postponed, I mean, at least in, in this, you know, in, in my use of feeling of affection uh, to describe what's mind when the tension is extracted. Uh, the emotion is postponed. The emotion, who cares? I mean, you, you, you I mean, who cares about the emotion? Yes, we do care about the emotion because the the Facebook emoticons, <laughs> as they are called, <laughs> try to make distinctions. Even though sometimes, as I said, I don't know which emo how who am I is getting my emotion if it is a person posting or what's or the content, whatever. But then, but that emotion because it has a name it's given, it is, what you have is a sign, is a sign of a possible emotion. There is no content of the emotion. There is no elaboration of, of the emotion. And it's a countable sign. So we all know, right? We post on Facebook and like, you know, how many likes did I get? Especially profile pictures. I learned that they are the most important ones to like. So anyway, just uh, giving, giving up too much. But, but I just want to make it clear. It's not, doesn't quite get to the emotion. Uh, the hailing is the hailing of, you know, it's only, you, you, it's a signal of the affect. Um, and the people hate it, might as well. Doesn't matter. As long as that is a feeling, right? Some indication of a feeling. So, so would you would you characterize the emojis or emo, em, emoticons, or emojis, whatever, as as empty signifiers? I mean, I'm, and in some ways, I'm thinking about this as LeCloud would, uh, and then even Move would talk about empty signifiers. As so, empty signifiers. As empty signifiers. Empty yeah. signifiers. Well, yeah, that's that's a term that we could give to them because it's a, which is you see, but it's a term that I would give out how I would call them if I were considering them from the, from the discursive point of view, right? If I were to be, if that was a concern with meaning, mm -hmm. but the concern of the paper is with the form. So the form is, you know, um, yeah. So they have to be empty, right? I mean, who has time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the, the economy, of the attention economy knows that, it, you know, according to their logic, that that is not enough time, right? Uh, so, which is something I'd yeah, I'd love to talk more with now, you know, with Tiziana Terranova about it. So, because, you know, what happens to time? Because it is when you talk about attention, it's obviously it is about time, and yet the industry has found ways of cutting through the to the chase and giving you the effect access yeah. an effect without taking so much time but, even but, though it takes all your time because you know if you spend time in the online well and, and also i think that i think there's a way in which we can think about temporality or temporization in this sense in, in in relation to preemptive the preemptive culture of even the um the the emo emojis themselves and um and the kind of the ways in which they're literally not just pulling them but they're literally preempting the very the very affects that that are that um, and, and enacting and inciting affects in and of themselves. Um, the, uh, let me um, go to the next question here, and and we might be time for this last question. We might have time for one more question. We'll see. Um, but Kareem Sharif says, thank you for this amazing lecture. How do you think these developing technological platforms are informing our conceptions of the social sphere? If they are complexing, if they are complexing means of human communication, do you think these new forms of knowledge production, these techno virtual experiences, are altering how we conceive of systems like racial capitalism and how we analyze them? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, hmm. I do, so I in 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 the in in the presentation I took the position of the, the societies of control, right? And that's the question, you know, what happens when we are hailed as, uh, as individuals? And, and what, what was interesting that, but then there was no possible, no organized way of having it in the presentation itself is 
the fact that as I started uh, analyzing uh, Black Mirror from that perspective, it just came to me a, a question that it's related to yours, which is not so much about how the, the technological platforms are informing our conception of the social sphere, but whether our conceptions of how the technological platforms are informing the social sphere are now being deployed in our presentations of the social sphere, whether it is Black Mirror or you know, a TV, TV like show, or whether it's an academic paper. So our reading of how, how we, the things that are mediating our lives now, how we interpret them may now be, become part of how we live. It doesn't matter, so what I'm saying is, uh, um, if I use the, the Marxist distinction, the old fashioned infrastructure and superstructure. So the, your question, Karim, is whether the infrastructure is affecting the, so the, the superstructure, right? The social, cultural, whatever. And I'm saying, and perhaps given continuity to what I was saying before, is that I was, I was asking myself the question as I'm working on the, on the presentation, whether this reading of how the te techno virtual infrastructure is informing our superstructure, whether it has become part of our superstructure, regardless of what the actual effect of the conditions of you know, production are. So I don't know if that, does it make sense? I can see Ezekiel, does it, I can't see you, Karim, sorry. Um, so that's a question. And then because I, because, because I was trained as a sociologist, I, you know, I will keep it as a question because that is a social, there are sociological answers. Yeah, either, either you say yes or you say no, but I, don't, I think it's more complicated than that. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Now, um, I don't know if they are complexifying uh, means of human communication. It seems, right, when you look at them, it seems that it's actually very simplistic. They are simplifying it to, you know, like to emojis or emoticon. And we find ourselves using them and learning how to, to use them. But um, in regards to whether it's help, it's changing or making, altering how we conceive of capitalism and racial capitalism, um, I don't think um yeah so on the one hand we may we may say that it's yes right if we focus on content that you know through these platforms we we know we have more information about what's happening everywhere um including the information i gathered about the you know the minerals that are extracted and you know how they are used in the in the in the cell phones, for instance. On the one hand, we can say well, but I think and this is what I tried to show in my in my analysis at the end. The end that you know when at least when humanity raciality are working together, and on the one hand, and as long as we begin describing the those the humans in those under those conditions in terms of a distinction between captivity and liberty we we are just doing the same thing <laughs> we are just employing the same basic uh, mode for explaining racial subjugation and and uh, and capitalist exploitation and colonial uh, expropriation which which begins from this fundamental separation between with that which is properly European and hence properly capitalist and to be critiqued in an analysis of capitalism and that which is you know about how people think and their beliefs which either we see them as being fundamentally no modern hence hopefully um, you know fixable if we just make liberalism more widespread or we bring it in our critique of capital and says, well, so any critique of capital will have to take into account the fact that racial difference and cultural difference function, you know, at the superstructural level. So I think what I'm saying is that our explanations um, 
we gotta get better at, you know, at, at examining both our conditions of existence, our infrastru infrastructural conditions of existence, and also whatever counts as, as, um, as the symbolic. And I know we are running out of time. I'm just, you know, just the images of Wednesday the 6th, right? You have that, that apparent collapsing of, of, of the liberal um, architectures with white supremacy in which, you know, everybody, oh my goodness, you know, they are destroying our, um, you know, the capital, the symbol of America's democracy, while the people who are doing it were saying they are taking their country back. So we have got to begin acknowledging how those liberal capitalist infrastructures are fundamentally racial, right? And that's why those people are there to get their, their country back. But anyway, tomorrow the country will go back to some kind of normality, <laughs> which is a problem, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Right, right. You know, I, 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 I um, so we literally could probably go on for a whole nother hour about January 6th, especially in relation to what you've just laid out today. But obviously we don't have that time. Um, and, but I. You know what? I'll, I'll save this question. I, I won't. I, we're we're right up on time. But I, I um, so thank you, thank you, uh, Denise for uh, such an amazing talk, um, uh, brilliantly laid out, um, and uh, and engaging so many different um, uh, topics, putting threading it through Black Mirror, three different episodes of Black Mirror, um, and 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 this question around dignity in relation to raciality, in relation to. Um, uh, the post enlightenment subject um, in relation to um, desire, um, visualizable, uh, visualizability, racial subjugation. Um, uh, and I know I'm forgetting another important theme here, but um, but yes, all, all in all, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank um, you. And I, I know I can say for myself, I will be continuing to sit on on, on this and, and, and meditating on this, and I'll probably be emailing you some questions. Um, but, um, um, and so I have to say, so this is, a, um, how would I characterize, um, bit, almost a bittersweet um, conclusion, if you will, not, not to your talk, but to the speaker series itself. Um, as, um, uh, this you you marked actually the finale, if you will, the, our final speaker for the series. Um, I, I in fact began this series five years ago, in collaboration with my colleague Jim yeah. English, um, uh, of the English Department in the Price Lab for Digital Humanities, and um, who has continued to support this series every year. And then the past four years, I have also been fortunate to collaborate with uh, another one of my amazing colleagues, Jess Lingle of, of, of Annenberg. Whom, whom, whom you met, of course. Um, and each year we've had uh, such a fun and uh, fun time and, and been lucky really in, in our ability to curate um, and engage with amazing scholars and speakers such as yourself um, and, and have had that opportunity to host. So I'm very appreciative to, um, to both Jim and Jessa for their colleagueship and collaboration and, and have to publicly acknowledge that and as, as we conclude and, and look forward to other things that Jessa and I are cooking up with my postdoc, uh, Nicole Sansone. Um, we have also benefited from the important behind the scenes work of both SB2 and Annenberg staff, media and communications um, teams, um, uh, PhD students who have helped to support along the way and all of our attendees and participants along the way. So I, I hope you all have enjoyed the series as much as we have. And, and uh, I, I definitely say, please stay tuned to what's to come next. Um, Denise, you have given an amazing um, grand finale to the series. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for joining us this semester. I know our students are excited about your course this semester, so. I'm so, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for the invite. And uh, yeah, congratulations. I mean, sad when things come to an end, but it's, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Better to come to an end on a high note though, so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, bye.